Hello, squires. Fighters are the sword-swinging martial masters of D&D who hit things real hard. Liches are people who feel like the whole dying thing was not for them, so they've decided to put their soul in some kind of spooky Tupperware of doom to avoid that whole mess. But can these two things coexist and fuse to make a completely new thing? We're about to find out. I am Antonio D'Amico, this is Pointy Hat, and welcome to Witch Lich! That's right, yet another installment in this thing I call a series. On Witch Lich, I throw a dot at a wall until I land on a DD and d class, I take that class, and then I make it into a Lich, an undead guy that simply refuses to die. Bars. You know how this goes by now, and if you don't, don't you worry, baby. You're about to find out. We gotta distill these two concepts down to their essence in order to fuse them. Let's start with the fighter first. What is the essence of the fighter? Well, that's a deceptively hard question to answer. I made a whole video about fighters, go watch it after this, I worked very hard on it and it comes with a whole free subclass. And though I love the class, I find it offers very little guidance to build characters around because of its lack of built-in flavor. These boys are unseasoned. Now, the problem we find ourselves in, yes, we, I like to pretend you guys sit with me and do this with me, I'm very lonely. The problem we run into when we try to make a fighter lich is that the guidance that other classes give are sort of what makes their essence. Bards ask you to make a performing character, and that's the class's essence. Barbarians ask you to make a berserker, and that's the essence of the class. Fighters ask you to make a guy that fights, and that's, that's it. This lack of safety rails makes it so that fighters can be basically anything, but it also makes it hard to pin down. But never let it be said that we back down from a challenge. Yes, still we, don't leave me. So let's find this essence I keep talking about. I think our first clue might be hidden in the martial archetypes of the fighter. It's subclasses, for those that don't use the fun little words the game uses for each class. Banneret, Battlemaster, Cavalier, Echo Knight, Eldritch Knight, Rune Knight, Samurai, Arcane Archer. Bus, club, another club. You see what I'm seeing? There's a through line to most of these. Military. It's even there in the flavor of the class, for what little there is of it in the fighter, and its abilities. You learn fighting styles as a fighter, you can use all weapons, you can fight using all armors, you are a professional fighter. And what is a professional fighter but someone in the military? Okay, I got the essence of the fighter, I did it! What do you mean we? So what is the essence of a lich, so we can fuse it with that of the fighter? Well, on this channel, we do that with a little checklist of our own. Let's go through it. But before we make any liches anywhere, you gotta find a place to put them in. Like, where are you actually playing? Some dungeon masters rely on their words alone to bring their players into whatever location they conjure. But some others literally open a portal to the location itself and use this translocation magic alongside their way with words to transport their players to the very places that only exist in their imagination. How? With the right table, of course. The Arena Game Table, to be exact, from Game Theory Tables. Okay, listen up, because this is one of my holy grail D&D items. I want this so bad. This is one of those amazing tables with a digital display in it, so you can project your maps right on the table, but... First of its kind, it's a digital touchscreen. The screen is a touchscreen. So not only can you pull amazing maps on it, but you and your players can interact with the table itself. The arena game table offers their own dynamic maps, interactive character sheets, and a ton of customization options to make your table yours. It's basically taking the already amazing idea of a display D&D table to its logical and yet insane to think about conclusion. And, I'm very excited about this, you can close it with panels and it becomes a normal usable table for non-nerd activities. And it comes with its own little accessories to make it even more useful. So if all of this sounds good, the Kickstarter is up right now and and all tables and accessories are discounted for the Kickstarter. And there's like a week left on it, so if you're interested, the time is now. It's the very first link in the description of this very video you're watching. And now that we have a place to put our liches, let's make a lich. I call this the pointy hat, trademark, copyrighted, all rights reserved, do not steal lich recipe. Or the fatikrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
3. Fail Actory. This, to me, is the most important aspect of Lichdom. Liches achieve undeath by refusing to die. The way they do this is by making it so that even if they die, they don't die. Great explaining on my part. The ritual to become a lich includes creating a phylactery, a container for the lich's soul. That way, if the lich is slain, it'll just respawn like an annoying mob next to its phylactery in X business days. I I'm sure someone out there is farming lich spawns. Not a bad idea. Hold on, let me write that down somewhere. That sounds like a good plot hook. Anyway, finally, four. Lichdom is not passive. A lich has to actively work towards staying a lich and not just evaporating into a cartoon dust cloud. This makes it so liches are active participants in whatever world you decide to let them loose in, you maniac. A lich that can just chill for eternity is a lich that has no reason to bump into players, annoy them, or go against them, or befriend them. A lich that needs to keep working to remain opposite of both alive and dead is an interesting player in the world. Cool, so we have our recipe down, undead guy that simply refuses to die. We have our fighter essence, military. How about we combine the two and make a fighter lich. Let me present to you the Death March. Even achieving on death is not enough for a fighter to actually become a Death March. Death Marches are liches that achieve true on death by conscription. A fighter that seeks on death as a way to unnaturally extend their life must undergo a long journey marked by death at every step. Their ritual to achieve lichdom consists in challenging fellow masters of the fighting arts, those that have mastered all different styles used in battle, and ending their lives. Once they have slain the last one of these fighters, there's just one last fighter to put to the sword, themselves. If the foes they fought against prove to be worthy opponents, the fighter will rise again in undeath, but not as a true lich. Their bodies won't decay and they'll retain their faculties and fighting prowess they had in life, but will find true death if slain, as they don't yet have a phylactery. The second stage of achieving true lichdom for fighters can then begin. Conscription. The undead fighter will continue to slay worthy opponents. If slain by the fighter, these opponents will rise in undeath too as unliving puppets of the undead fighter, retaining all fighting abilities they had in life. These are the undead fighter's phylacteries. This is what constitutes a death march lich. The death march will amass a veritable army of undead, armed forces of the dead that follow its every command. The more are conscripted into the death march, the stronger the death march grows, and the more options for a phylactery the lich has if slain. Any member of the death march can house the soul of the lich if this one is killed. But there's a catch. All members of the Death March must remain in relative proximity of each other to stay undead, which stops the Lich from stashing away corpses in remote locations to use as emergency phylacteries. But this isn't the reason why a Death March must constantly add new members to its undead forces. The body currently housing the soul of the Lich is the only body free from the cave. All other members of the Death March, the one dead, will slowly rot away. The wounds sustained in combat won't close with time. They are, in a way, in a slow death march of their own, crawling towards true death. If a death march wishes to continue to enjoy the benefits of a lichdom, it must constantly add new members to its forces. This makes death marches, paradoxically, one of the liches that is most active in the goings on of the living, as they thrive when geopolitical conflict arises. Death marches will be the first to the battlefield when war erupts between two nations, and many death marches will stoke the flames of war themselves, pushing conflicts to escalate into all out war so they may find more conscripts to their army. Most civilized societies see the use of death marches in armed conflict as deeply inhumane, seeing as those that fall to the undead sword aren't even afforded the meager comfort of resting in death, but few are above using them if truly desperate. When the enemy is at your doorstep and all hope is lost, who is above accepting any help, even if it's the help of death itself? And so, death marches become a forever standing army, constantly traveling in search for new members to add to its death battalion, robbing more and more fighters of resting in peace until they rot away, or their own body becomes the new vessel of the commander that conscripted them into service beyond death. That's pretty cool, I think. Undead army lich, standing army lich, war lich. Imagine the possibilities that these guys bring to your campaigns. As I always say, story arises from conflict, and these guys are conflict, like themselves. What is more conflict e than war? And like I always say, a monster is not truly a cool monster until it gives as much to do to the players as it does to the DMs. So why don't we think of a player character that uses the idea of the death march? Let's go. 
When the army of an ever-growing empire broke through the castle's defenses, only one member of the royal family of an extremely small nation was not put to the sword. Princess Naroa, future queen of the former kingdom, was smuggled away by the captain of a royal guard, and is now the only living member of the royal line. Naroa could only watch as the invading nation leveled her kingdom to the ground, absorbing it into its empire as it had already done to many others. She was taught protocol, dancing, embroidery, and diplomacy, but under the watchful tutelage of the captain that saved her, she now picks up the sword with a single goal in mind, given to her by her own captain, of all people. Naroa will rebuild her army and take back what's hers, through any means necessary, including lichdom. She spends the next years running, hiding her true identity from those that wish to completely eradicate her line, all the while training in the fighting styles her captain can teach her, always keeping her goal of becoming a death march in mind. Once Naroa is ready, her and the captain engage in one last duel, not a training one this time, a duel to the death. And Naroa emerges victorious. With tears in her eyes, she takes her first steps towards becoming a death march. Naroa has slain the first of the many masters of a fighting style, and she'll have to slay many more if she wishes to finally avenge her family and her kingdom. She now travels alongside an adventuring party. Naroa has told them she's training to become a better fighter, and wants to battle and defeat the best of the best, which is not untrue. But she's not told them why she's doing this. Naroa continues her march towards death. What will her party do when they find out the true reason behind her training? I don't know, you do, if you play her, or you use her as an NPC or something. And nobody's allowed to make fun of me for making yet another princess in disguise. It's a trope for a reason, guys. I'm allowed to have fun. It's my show, and not yours. I think she's a dex base fighter, so give her high dex. High charisma for all those etiquette lessons she got as a kid. The fun gimmicky shtick of not knowing what things cost. I mean, it's one banana, Michael. What could it cost? $10? A solid heap of trauma, and presto, your very own murderous princess. Give Princess Peach a gun. In D&D, do it. But what about you DMs out there? How could you include the Death March into your games? Well, there truly are like a hundred ways I can think of. So let's do one to get you started. The small nation the players have spent time knowing and falling in love with is now under attack by a much larger army. The players want to help, but their help alone won't stop an invasion. The ruler of the nation and its people are desperate, desperate enough to accept help, any help, and that's when an eerily silent army comes into the capital. A death march offers their services to the kingdom, asking nothing in return other than new equipment for their troops. There's no catch other than a moral one. The death march is the only hope of this kingdom to survive the attack. But will the players accept to fight alongside the undead, knowing that anyone the death march puts to the sword will rise again and join their ranks? Or will they forsake the kingdom they've grown to love through the course of this campaign? If they don't, if they fight alongside the Death March, what happens then? Imagine they win and manage to hold off the enemy forces, but the Death March pushes the ruler to switch from defensive to offensive maneuvers. What if the Death March convinces the ruler that the Empire at their doorstep will never stop being a threat until they are eradicated? What will the players do then? What if the players convince the kingdom to not accept the Death March's help? Maybe the Death March recognizes that the kingdom is weak and prone to an attack by the Death March itself. So now the players have to contend with an invasion and an attack by the forces of the Death March while they try to make alliances with neighboring countries for help. Political intrigue, war stories, but add liches to it. Everything is better with liches. That's the point you had formula, baby. A shame you can't really use it. I mean, you could very much just... I guess take a normal fighter stat block for the soldiers in a Death March's army, but, but what about the Death March itself, the leader of the army? You would need a stat block for that, and a cool one. What does a fighter lich's stat block actually look like? I guess good luck figuring that out. You can let me know when you do that. I guess you'll have to make one yourself. Unless you join my own Death March. That's right. The link to the Death March, the fighter lich, is in the description of this very video for 100% certified free. Provided you just enlist in my army of undeath. Easy. But what if you love the whole martial lich concept, but fighter is just not the flavor for you? Well, here's my video on making a barbarian lich. And if the whole monster that hoards people sounds like a thing you would like more of, here's one of my dragon videos where I make dragons based on D&D classes. Enjoy. Peace and love. Mwah.